because this topic is at the heart of the Christian faith. And it is certainly important for uh, Muslims as well. Jesus Christ, uh, before he left his disciples and uh, ascended to heaven, he told them uh, that forgiveness and repentance will be preached to all nations, beginning from Jerusalem until the ends of the earth. So in a sense, he summed up the gospel message in these two words, forgiveness of sins and repentance. Forgiveness being God's offer <coughs> and repentance being the response of human beings to God's offer. So it is really at the heart of the gospel. The gospel means the good news. Why is the gospel good news? It is precisely because it is about God's forgiveness, not about God's condemnation. It is about God's love and not about God's judgment. So thank you for choosing such a, a critical topic and it is so important not only in terms of our relationship with our Creator but also in our relationship with each other. It is such an important topic that I chose to look into this topic for my PhD research <coughs> and in fact I devoted my degree in Islamic studies to this topic but we have uh, an eminent speaker from the Muslim uh, group this, uh, this evening, so I'm not going to talk about Islam, but rather about forgiveness in Christianity. And I look forward to the discussion that we are going to have uh, around uh, this topic. <coughs> so it is true that uh, I am uh, from Syria. I was born uh, into a Christian home and uh, I'm very grateful for the years that I spent in Syria which uh, provided me with plenty of opportunities to befriend Muslims and to engage with them on all sorts of topics including religious ones. It is from that time that I started to have dialogue with Muslims from the time when I was a teenager and it did not stop. Uh, I spent 20 years in Paris when I had uh, the, my uh, academic uh, education as well as uh, the opportunity to meet my uh, wife-to-be, who is not French by the way, but uh, she was doing research in France. <coughs> and uh, now it is uh, a great joy for me to get involved in uh, World Vision, where we operate in 20 Muslim majority countries because uh, we wanted to, you know, demonstrate God's love for all people, regardless of their religious or ethnic background. Okay, that's about me. Let's come back to the topic of forgiveness. Before we talk about forgiveness, we need to talk about sin because forgiveness does not have any meaning if we are not aware of what sin, sin means. So forgiveness does not take its full meaning outside this context. Let's talk about sin in the Bible. Well, sin, first of all, is a dis disobedience to God's law, to God's command. This disobedience disrupts our relationship with our Creator, with each other, with our own being, and with the environment. But uh, sin is more than disobedience to God's law. It is an offense to the lawgiver. Because uh, our Creator created us in His image to have close relationship with Him and therefore 
when disobey his law, he is personally offended. He is personally grieved, saddened, affected. When we decide to, uh, you know, turn away from God, he is not just displeased, but he is uh, grieved. Because uh, he created us with the purpose of having a close relationship with him. What about uh, the seriousness of sins? You know, all sins are serious. So much so that Jesus said, if you look at a woman or a man with lust, you have already committed adultery in your heart. So all sins are serious. <coughs> Sin is particularly serious because we have actually disobeyed not a dictator, a tyrant, but we have disobeyed our loving and gracious God. In a sense, it is more serious to disobey your father or mother than to disobey your, you know, boss. Because the relationship with your parents are closer than the relationship with your boss, hopefully. I'm not going to talk about you know, the unforgivable sin because of lack of time. The scope of sin, well, sin is universal. Every human being has sinned in one way or another. There is no one person on earth who has not committed sin. And this is including prophets, including prophets. And this is a difference with Islam, because uh, Islam teaches that uh, prophets are immune from committing sin. Whereas the Bible unfortunately tells us the truth about you know, prophets who have committed some serious sins. David committed adultery and murder. Noah got a drunk, etc. Why? Well, this shows that sin is really deep-rooted in human nature. That even prophets have committed major sin. Sin is deeply rooted in the human heart. One day, a group of uh, religious leaders asked Jesus, why do your disciples do not wash their hands before eating? And Jesus told them, you know, what makes people unclean is not what go into their stomach, but what comes out of their mouth. Because what comes out of the mouth is comes out of the heart. And here is what comes out of the heart according to Jesus. You know, the list is quite impressive. <coughs> In other words, we are not just sinners, people who commit bad deeds. We are sinful. And what we do reflects who we are deep inside our being. Our nature is sinful, which is why we commit evil deeds. And that's reparation of sin. Here we have another difference between Christianity and Islam. Because in Christianity, our good deeds do not make up for our bad deeds. We will never ever be able to pay with our good deeds the wrong that we have done. Of course, we are commanded to do good, but our good deeds will not compensate for our evil deeds. You know, if you commit a, a traffic offense and the policeman or the policewoman stop you and said, oh, did you see the traffic line? You know, if you come to the traffic uh, 
you know, to, to the police, and I said, you know, I have respected the traffic light thousands of times. So would you please uh, forgive me for this time? What do you think the likely answer you will get? No, just because you have respected the traffic light thousands of times doesn't mean that I will forgive you this one. You should have respected it this time as well. So your good deeds will not make up for your evil deeds whatsoever. This is what the, this text says. By works of the law, no human being will be justified in his sight. And Jesus uh, tells us this, that uh, often religious people are tempted to become self-righteous. Two men, Je Jesus tells the story of two men who went into the temple. One of them was a very religious man. So he went in front of the temple and said to God, I thank you for I do my prayers. I fast regularly. I do my offerings. I do not commit murder. I do not commit adultery. And the second man was kneeling in the back of the temple. And he just said to God, Oh God, have mercy on me because I am a sinner. Short prayer. And Jesus said of the two men, it was actually the second who went back home, accepted by God. God was pleased with the simple prayer of this man who confessed his sins, rather than with the man who was practicing religious person. But his religious practice led him to be arrogant and self-righteous. The penalty of sin is death. You know, God said to Adam and Eve, the day you will eat from this tree, you will die. Now, they did not die physically, but they died spiritually. They broken their relationship with God, the creator, the giver of life. But later on, they died, they died physically. And Jesus uh, told his uh, a group of people, unless you repent, you will all perish. Now, the word repent, often in the Gospels, and especially in this text, does not mean repenting from one specific sin. Repent in the Gospels often refer to Coming back to God, turning back to God, trusting in Him wholeheartedly, making Him the center of our life, committing yourself to follow Him. <coughs> this is what repentance means. No, not confessing one singular sin, but coming to a new relationship with God unless you repent or you convert. The Greek word actually can be also translated convert. Now remember that Jesus was talking to Jewish people. Other, in other words, to people who have been religious, who believed in God, who believed in Moses. And many of them were practicing people. And yet Jesus told them, and yes, you you repent. In other words, it's not good enough to do good things, even to practice the law, because what God is after is your own heart. God looks at the heart, says the Bible, not at the appearance of people, but right at their heart, at what is inside. And He wants us to love Him. Jesus summed up the law of Moses in these two commands. Love God with all your heart and love your neighbor as yourself. The punishment 
For sin is death, spiritual and physical, on this earth, and in the hereafter it is eternal punishment. Separation from God. Because God is just, as you will see. Now I move on to the forgiveness. After we have uh, taken some understanding of what sin is in the Bible. Now to talk about forgiveness in uh, 15 minutes is difficult. So one way is to refer to a fundamental event in the history of Israel, which is told in both the Quran and the Bible. After the Jewish people came out of Egypt under the leadership of Moses, Moses went on the mountain to receive God's law. And his people were down there in the valley. They got impatient. And one day they decided under the leadership of Aaron, Moses' brother, to worship a golden calf. Moses comes down from the mountain and sees his people involved in, adult, in idolatry. <coughs> idolatry is a form of spiritual adultery. So he is outraged. He throws the tablets of the law so much that he was uh, uh, full of anger. And God tells him that he is going to destroy his people. So much was serious, their, their, so serious was their sin. And Moses is full of love for his people, despite his anger against them. So he steps in and intercedes on their behalf and asks God to forgive them. And God said, okay, I'm not going to destroy them completely. So God actually punishes the people and yet shows his mercy because he does not destroy them completely. He decides that some of them should still, most of them actually should still remain alive. And then God reveals himself to Moses in these words. The Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, keeping steadfast love for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, but who will, who will by no means clear the guilty. Now I would like to focus on these two characters of God. On the one hand, he is a forgiving God. Because he is a loving God, and forgiveness is an expression of his love. But on the other hand, he is a righteous God, a just God. So how is he going to be both forgiving and righteous? He wants to forgive people because he loves them. But on the other hand, he is holy and just. He must punish their wickedness. So can God actually forgive people without compromising his justice? Because if he forgives people, what about his justice? And if he destroys them, what about his forgiveness and his love? You see, God is faithful to himself. He must be both, faith, uh, both forgiving and righteous. But how? How to forgive the sinners and at the same time condemn their sin? This is impossible, at least from a human point of view. Is God incapable of forgiving people without compromising injustice? Well, the answer is nothing is impossible to God. What is impossible to human beings is not impossible to God. Because God is sovereign. And to be sovereign means that God has the power 
to do everything he wants. And he has the authority to do everything he wants. What does he want? He wants to forgive. But how to forgive without undermining his own justice? Well, the answer is Jesus Christ, according to the Gospel. At the heart of Jesus' mission is his death on the cross <coughs> and his resurrection, which are the foundational events for God's forgiveness. God reconciled the world in Christ. You know, the death of Jesus Christ was not just the expression of the Jewish people wanting to kill Jesus. Yes, of course they wanted to kill Jesus, and this was a particularly awful sin. But it was actually God who sent, who came in the person of Jesus Christ, to take upon himself our sin and the penalty for our sin. The penalty for our sin, as we said, is death. <coughs> so God, the Father, sent God the Son in the person of Jesus Christ, who out of love for us as human beings, decided to take upon his own shoulders our sinfulness. And as a result, when Jesus was on the cross, Jesus himself was condemned by God. God forsaken him. So much so that Jesus cried, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Have you abandoned me? This was the time when Jesus expiated for our own sin. Not for his own sins, because Jesus was sinless. But because Jesus was sinless, sin could not overcome him. God raised Jesus from the death. And Jesus spent 40 days on earth before he ascended to heaven, showing himself as the risen Christ to his own disciples. Jesus was the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, according to this beautiful statement made by John the Baptist, Yahya, and the Gospel. Jesus is the sacrificial Lamb which takes away the sin of the world. God's forgiveness in Christ is therefore the cornerstone of the gospel message. And uh, here is, uh, if you like, the Christian, one Christian key creed that I might call, call it the Christian Shahada in a sense. The Christian confession of faith. There is one God and there is one mediator. Jesus struck between God and man. The man Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all. One God and one mediator. Because you see, the problem is not that we do not know God's will, or God's word, or God's law. The problem is much deeper than that. The problem is that we are either unwilling to comply with God's law, which we know, or we are unable to comply with God's law. If not God's law, at least the voice of our conscience. So our need is not just for a prophet. Our need is much deeper than that. Our need is for a savior, 
a savior who forgives our shortcomings, but who enables us to live up to God's standard. Because God's standards, according to the Christian gospel, are very high. You know, Jesus said to his disciples, be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. Now tell me, is it easy to be perfect for you? It's not for me to be, you know, it's impossible for me to be perfect. Far from that. Love your enemies. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who persecute you. This is Jesus' teaching. Who is able to live up to this teaching? No one. Which is why we are sinners, sinful, needing God's forgiveness, but needing a Savior. Not just God's forgiveness, needing a Savior. And needing the Holy Spirit of God to empower us, to, to enable us to live up to God's law, up to God's teaching. Let me conclude. God's forgiveness of our sins, according to the Christian faith, can be summed up as, uh, as such. First of all, it is costly. It is not cheap. I forgive you, and that's it. No. It cost Jesus his own life. It cost Jesus nothing else than his own life. Because he gave his own life as a self-sacrifice on the cross for us. In order for God to be able to forgive us and to keep his holiness, his justice, without compromising it. Second, God's forgiveness is universal. This promise is made to everyone, regardless of their religious or ethnic background. It is really for every human being. Third, it is unconditional. It does not depend on our good deeds, because it is based on Jesus' death on the cross, Jesus' atoning death on the cross. And Jesus died once for all as a sacrifice, and God raised Jesus from the dead, demonstrating that his sacrifice has been fully accepted by God. God's forgiveness is undeserved because it is founded on God's love, not on our good deeds. And God loves us because He is love, according to the Gospel. We can do nothing that make God loves us, loves us more. And we can do nothing that make God loves us less. Because his love for us does not depend on our merits, on our good deeds. It depends on who he is, on his very nature. God is love. This is what the gospel says about him. Therefore, God's forgiveness is undeserved. And because it is undeserved, it is certain, it is sure. Because it does not depend on how many good deeds I can produce. It depends only on his unmeasurable love for us. It is unlimited. It covers all our sins, whether they are serious or minor, hidden or disclosed. You know, on the cross, there were two thieves. And one of them told Jesus, remember me when you come in your kingdom. And Jesus told him, today I tell you, you will be with me in paradise. You know, this was a criminal who at the very last minute of his life appealed to Jesus' forgiveness. And he was immediately listened to. God's forgiveness is unchanging. He does not tell us, I have forgiven you today, but tomorrow I may withdraw my forgiveness. No. 
once done, it's done for all, forever. Because God is faithful to his word. And finally, God's forgiveness is challenging. Because it requires a response. It is not that, okay, I have forgiven you, now you do whatever you like. No. Now that I have forgiven you, how are you going to respond? How are you going to respond? And the only appropriate response is to forgive others. Which is why in the prayer that the Lord Jesus has taught his disciples, he instructed them to say, Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. The forgiven received from God results in forgiven, given to, forgiveness given to others. <coughs> and sometimes, you know, in asking forgiveness from others, which is sometimes more difficult to say to someone, I'm very sorry for what I have done to you. So forgiving others in, in Christianity is not an option. It is an obligation. And yesterday evening with some of you, we have looked at this text in the Gospel, which is followed by this a comment by Jesus. If you do not forgive your brothers and sisters, God will not forgive you. If you forgive your brothers and sisters, God will forgive you. Showing that forgiving others is an obligation. It is a command. If you don't do it, it means that you have not really understood what God forgiveness means. It's like the story that Jesus tells in the Gospel. Someone had one million dollars debt. And he's unable to pay his debt. So he goes to his creditor and he tells him, I'm very sorry, I can't pay my debts. So the, the creditor, the creditor, the lender, if you like, say, okay, I'm not going to sue you. I just want to cancel your debt because I love you. And this guy who had just his one million dollars forgiven, cancelled, he goes out of the house and on, on, on his way home, he finds a, uh, a fellow human being and he tells him, you owe me one hundred dollars. Give them to me immediately, otherwise I will take you to the court and you will have to pay for them. And, you know, one hundred dollars compared with one million dollars. Now, the point in, in this story is this, that, you know, God's forgiveness is so much greater, the forgiveness that we receive from God, than the forgiveness that we need to give others. If you have really understood and appreciated God's forgiveness of your sins, you will always be grateful to God. And your gratefulness will be demonstrated in doing your best to please God, to love God, to live up to His standards, and to love others, to forgive them, even your own enemies, if needed. Well, I hope that you will have the time to discuss these further, but now I would like to invite my uh, Muslim uh, partner, shall I say, or brother. Yes, come and, uh, yes, brother, because partner in this uh, society, uh, <laughs> you know, is ambiguous, right? <laughs> so that's why uh, my Muslim brother, yes.